now head back to north of the border. We head back to Scotland, and I'm pleased to have alongside us for Commentator's Corner episode number 16. He's the host of the Peter McKay Most Sport podcast and the Porsche Sport po podcast, fresh from his jaunt over to uh, the uh, self-proclaimed World Centre of Speed, the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Very warm welcome to Peter McKay. How are you doing, Peter? Good to see you, buddy. And lovely to see the ALMS Penske Porsche RS Spider behind you. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, the the the, the RS Spider uh, is a car very close to my my heart, having written a, written a, a book about it over the last couple of years, which hopefully will be uh, coming to market later in the year. And uh, it's uh, it's it's been a very very cool experience. So uh, great. I thought that would be a good one to put on my background for uh, for our chat today. <laughs> uh, fair enough. So. Um... Well, let's get straight into it. We've got a tight time schedule, unlike episode 15, which went on longer than a piece of string. Uh, probably nearly broke a new commentator's corner record. Um, but, Peter, firstly, um, both yourself and David Christie, David being a previous host on the show, have uh, been in the commentary box at Knock Hill. Um, but how did you get bitten by the motorsport bug, first of all? Oh, good question. I mean, I I, I think uh, well, the, the the memory that really sticks for me is when Colin McRae won the World Rally Championship back in 1995 uh, in uh, Subaru Impreza, and it was actually the the person really responsible for exposing me to that was actually my mum. The, the maybe more traditional story is dad and lad, mm -hmm. but actually it was my mum who was the real speed demon in our family. She still is. And uh, yeah, she 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 loved rallying, and you know she had a, a Nova SR uh, in the eighties when Colin Ooh. McRae was in a was in an, a, an SMT backed Nova at the, at the time. So Colin McRae for me was he was like Superman, Batman, uh, and Ace Ventura all all in one. He, <laughs> he was just the he was just the man for me. And I remember running to the Gary's paper shop in Octorada in the time where I grew up. To buy Autosport every Thursday and read up on how Colin had got on, and it was usually he'd either won the rally or had a spectacular accident, and that almost endeared it to him more. You know, sometimes it, I remember your know, dad would come home from work and he'd maybe heard on the radio, and he's like, "If you heard what happened, McRae has crashed again." But it just it was just big highs, big lows with Colin, and that kind of it made him a very Scottish sports star. <laughs> when he was good, he was spectacular, but when he was bad, he was he was he, you know he could have spectacular moments too. So that was definitely what bit the bug. Uh, they gave me the bug, I think, and it's just sort of grown arms and legs ever since. Yeah, still remember when he got the nickname, the moniker Captain Crash, especially when he spectacularly rolled the. Uh, focus entry that he was in when mm. that was back in the early days when Malcolm Wilson and M Sport decided to uh, take a chance on him. And then also Carlos Sainz uh, being his teammate and Colin, I think, I can't remember which rally it was. He spectacularly rolled it and he still managed to keep on going uh, before it got crashed again. Uh, mm. But the less said about that, the better. God rest his soul. <laughs> um, and really good to hear that your mum was actually the the influence in that as well. Um, like you say, mm -hmm. a lot of the people that I've spoken to, it's like, yeah, sat down with dad or it was a friend or whatever. And that's, you're the first person on this show to actually say, yeah, it was actually my mum. And that's really, really cool. I mean, I still remember the Nova SRs, uh, 1.3. <laughs> and then it was just before they brought out the, G the, 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 everyone started shoehorning two litre, 16 valve GSI lumps from the, from the Astra with the digital dashboard. And then they used to take that dash like the LCD dash, I still remember it, like green hue with yellow instrument dials um, back in the day. So everyone was like transplanting them and they were all like on fast car or max power. Uh, and, and we're oh, talking I read like, both of those religiously when oh, I was mate, a teenager. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 <laughs> it sounds like we're in the same age bracket. So from my perspective, yeah. that's always a good thing. <laughs> it's always a good thing. Um, of course, uh, you know, with a lot of people, you know, not just Colin McRae, but of course, you, you have to look at Flash, Gordon Shedden, another fantastic talisman for Scottish motorsport. There's been a lot of people that have come from from Scotland that have competed, not just domestically, but also internationally. I mean, I still remember when Flash decided to dump BTCC and then went over to uh, Leopard Racing in the uh, in the T in the TCRs, the Audi R RS3 and decided to give it a go alongside uh, JK Vernet. And then decided, well, here we are now back in 2020, 
three and he's uh well i'm waiting for him to be confirmed back at uh at halford's halford's racing um for for another season in, in the british touring cars but what was the first ever race that you saw trackside oh well i think uh, there's two there's two answers to that one was and this would actually just i would imagine ever so slightly predate colin winning the world championship would be going to the perth rally Scottish Perth Rally, as it was called then, and we lived in a tiny, tiny little village with about 10 houses called Stormontfield, and right next to that was Schoon Palace, which was kind of one of the stately home stages, if you like, that were so popular at the time. And I remember Malcolm Wilson coming through in a blue and yellow Michelin pilot Ford Escort RS Cosworth, mm-hmm. and, I, and it was like a Saturn rocket had just gone past us, and again, it was just so cool. It was at night, and yeah, I, I remember that very vividly. And I ended up a year or two later getting for my Christmas my first Skelectric set and it had that very car as part of the set. So <laughs> that was that was uh that was very cool. Um so in terms of like you know, rallying, that was one. And then within a couple of years, I was lucky to sort of be growing up when the, the super touring era was at its real peak. And mm-hmm. uh again, mum mum would take me most of the time um to the British touring cars at Knock Hill. And uh, you know, it, I remember seeing Jason Plato in the um, oh the, the 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 British Racing Green Williams Renault Laguna with the Nescafe Blend Thirty Seven, yep. mm-hmm. and I remember him having a massive lock up into the uh, the hairpin, uh, and I remember even at that time going home and writing up a little sort of race report. I'm sure my mum's probably got it in a box somewhere to embarrass me with, but uh, mm-hmm. but I remember writing saying, "Oh, Jason Plato struggled to struggled with his tires." Uh, which I suppose was true because he, yeah. He, he, yeah, they were they were probably for the bin after that lock that lock up. So yeah, not kill plays a plays a part in the story to this day. Um, and for uh, really any uh, racing fan in Scotland, you know, not kill is uh, unlike down south where you have so many great circuits. In Scotland, we've got one, and luckily we've got a great one. <laughs> you know, we're we're lucky with Not Kill that they're such an incredible company run by great people. You know, Gillian Shedden, Gordon's wife, who, who, who Gordon Shedden, who you mentioned, they both. Uh, Gillian's the she's the boss. She runs the the circuit incredibly well. Has a great team of people, and they're it's a great family atmosphere in, at the circuit, and they play such a role in Scottish motorsport. Um, without them, it would be not nowhere near what it is yeah and of course another legend from uh touring cars of course we can't forget about the man the myth the legend good old john cleland of course the man's an animal <laughs> as always um and and funny enough saying about that um i was at the uh retro rides weekender at goodwood i was the mc for the event um last year which i'm quite fortuitous that they've asked me to come back so i'm back for for 2023 which i'm really looking forward to um, but we had the classic touring car racing club and we actually had the original pro drive chassis number one um there that has also been pedaled by john actually had mm-hmm. his name and this and the scottish salt tire on the the rear the rear windows which was pretty cool it's been converted from rear wheel drive to front wheel drive uh, ian pocklington is the guy that I, and, and i actually asked ian when they were all lined up on the grid so you had the number one pro drive Vauxhall Vectra chassis, GSI 16 valve. And then you had Kelvin Burt's um, Valvoline stickered 1994 Mondeo Super Tourer. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. We, we had the demonstration and it was like a missile was coming past at incredible velocity. And we were just waiting for the explosion. Um, and I actually said, to, <laughs> I actually, I actually asked uh, Mr. Pocklington, has John actually driven that? Yes, he has. And he thoroughly enjoys it. He said it's like bringing back the old days, apart from all the bad times when we, when we still remember the battle between Tim, Tim, him, Tim Harvey, and Steve Soper when they were in the Listerine BMW 318 ISs. Um, so, and I still remember John famously turning away from the driver's door, slamming it with his right hand, and just like looking straight ahead, uh, and like as if to say, "Don't come near me." Just don't come near me. Don't, don't, ang- you know, I'm angry enough as it is. You just don't want to get on the wrong side of me now. So, of course, Knock Hill is a fantastic circuit. It's one on my bucket list. I've always wanted to be, I've always wanted to go there. The The layout's fantastic. I've driven it in the virtual sense um, as well. So I can understand 
you know, going through Duffer's dip and going through the chicane where there's always someone that's going to try and make it too wide and someone nearly takes out the tyre barriers uh, either side of the chicane. Um, thank God it wasn't me in that virtual sense. But um, did you actually get your start at Knock Hill, Knock Hill when it came to commentary or uh, or was it somewhere else that that started? It was a combination, to be honest. Uh, I mean, the I wrote a letter to Gillian Shedden uh mm-hmm. at the end of 2019 and i was still i was working in the, the whiskey industry at the time mm-hmm. which i'd worked worked in the whiskey industry for oh, at that point for over 10 years my, my whole working life uh, and uh you know circumstances had, had, had moved to the point where I, I, you know I'd, I'd been i'd worked in my family business in the past and i'd and uh we we'd moved away from that and and i'd gone to work gone to work for another company and my I don't know I just I felt like I had a, a freedom to explore what I'd always wanted to do because people always used to ask me and I worked in the family business which I uh you know I, I enjoyed and I was very successful in but people always used to ask me if you weren't you know selling whiskey in your family business what would you do and I always said oh I'll be a motor racing commentator that's easy but it's a bit like saying oh, I'd be an astronaut you think how do you actually yeah. end up doing that because there's so few people that do it around the world and 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 so so, but I thought, what you know, why not? Why not have a go? And if it's a co- and you know, if it ends up being just a hobby, great. If it becomes a hobby, gone gone daft. If it goes further than that, even better. So I wrote a letter to Gillian Chen and amongst amongst others, uh, as well, um, saying that because when I did when I worked in the whiskey industry, I did a lot of public speaking, did a lot of whiskey tastings where you're doing a lot of presentation to people from other countries and, and mm-hmm. maybe where their languages, you know, their first language isn't uh, English and sort of used that as my hook. You know, I had absolutely zero experience, but luckily Knock Hill were, were needing to uh, grow their com- commentary team. So I sat down with uh, Stuart Gray, the circuit director, and Duncan Vincent, my colleague, who is now the the, the voice of 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 BSB and and also a pit lane reporter with the World Endurance Championship, and we sat down, sort of January February, uh, twenty twenty, all excited for a great season ahead, and you know, um, running a a Not Kill podcast along with it and everything like that, and then within six weeks, uh, the the global pandemic came in, but but not kill very much kept kept the promise and i started there uh i think it was in the october i mean there was the season was so short uh for actually having fans because the a lot we had events in 2020 but a lot of the time we didn't have fans there so it's kind mm-hmm. of no point having a commentator if there's no one to listen to it yeah so it was only really in october when when we when we when we got going and then it, it went on from there but where I actually got got my kind of hours up was uh, in in virtual motorsport in in sim racing, and that gave me a great opportunity to develop my develop my skills from ground zero because obviously you're you're starting from scratch. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Porsche Club of Great Britain took me on as their uh, commentator again, zero experience, uh, and then a number of of uh, sim sim racing channels as well. Uh, at the time, there's uh, Apex Racing TV, uh, Global Sim Racing Channel, uh, Race Spot, and forgive me if I'm, if I'm forgetting any others. But and and it was because of at the time as lockdown ensued, uh, there was virtual motorsport going on all the time, and there was yeah. simply not enough commentators to to fill all the the broadcasts that were necessary. So it really gave a lot of opportunity to to get a start and prove what I was capable of. And what transpired was. While this was all going on, I was on furlough of my for my daytime job. But mm-hmm. I was sort of even before then was deciding do I do I go all all in with this? And I uh, and I ended up having the decision made for me because I was sacked at the or made redundant at the end. At the end oh of God, May. yes. So so that was this that was that was decision made. That was decision made. Crack on and 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 it was it was that just that extra push that I needed because. I'd, in the January of that year, I'd gone out to Daytona with my little podcast and managed to get a, a press accreditation. And I had the most amazing weekend at Daytona there in the press room and seeing a world that I'd never seen before from that that side of it. And when I came on, home on the plane, I was, I was like, I have to find a way of making this work somehow. Mm. Uh, and so COVID actually, in, in some ways, it delayed it getting a start, but in other ways, it sped it on. Uh, yeah. you could look at it both ways. Yeah, 
I, I'd have to agree with you there because at that point, March 2020, when the, the famous words were uttered, you must stay at home, I was on furlough. And mm. then it was sort of like, I was, I was still, I was actually traveling to continental Europe to commentate for, for karting, for Rotax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, my friends were like saying, are you nuts? And I went, well, I'm getting 80% of my salary paid. I don't know mm. when we're going to be back. I might as well take this opportunity to, to spread my mm. wings and, and live the life that I've wanted to live as a most sport commentator, presenter, MC, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, mm. for me, sim racing, I mean, doing the Team Brit uh, Summer Series, then myself and David Christie doing the E-Team Brit GT Challenge, then it evolved into Sim Grid working for David Perel, um, then also doing work with Sim Staff, one of the, you know, one of the companies I work with now with regards to, to sim racing um the adac sim racing expo which hindi funnily enough did the commentary for the final events at the nurburgring last uh in in 2021 whereas myself and yusuf bin sahar we'd actually done the road to sim racing expo like qualifier events so james baldwin jardier all that lot um so yeah sim racing i was like thinking about maybe 2022 is the year when i'm going to break into sim racing and just give it a shot and then covid accelerated all of that and now here i am full time motorsport commentator in karting trying to get into something apart from karting i am trying um and but i think the thing is is that sim racing is is you know karting is always part and parcel of what i do um but that's a really good story to hear about with regards to, like you decided to take it upon yourself i mean obviously you've been working with uh smileable with regards to the world G world gt championship mm -hmm. um quite recently a, a championship that uh a, a mutual acquaintance of ours, Chaz Draycott, was also at one point on the commentary team for that one. Hello, uh, mm -hmm. good evening, Chaz. Um, <laughs> uh, and now he's doing a lot of stuff as well, uh, which which is great mm -hmm. to see. He's still doing his old like Formula Formula One, and you know all the other mm -hmm. bits and pieces he does on Chaz Draycott Media. Um, mm -hmm. Now, funny moments, social media. Now, when I approached David, I got the best ever GIF. You are a bit of a GIF merchant, like sending a... I love a GIF. A, I, love a, a GIF. I mean, the, the best one I've seen was when you sent one to Arjuna Kanker Party and Lewis McGlade with Kermit going like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 mean... I love it. That's one of my favourites, actually. The Kermit worried face. If yes. anyone's sort of for our, our audio listeners, you're sort of like chewing his teeth, waiting for an answer about something. Yes. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, so I mean, that's that's great just to have that kind of <laughs> that kind of personality. But I think also with the fact, um, you know, having listened to the Porsche Spot uh, podcast as well. I mean, Hayley Edmonds, uh, who we both know, has also been part of it. You know, you've spoken with Mark Lee. Also, there's some there's some great stuff coming. I think you've also been testing a, a road testing a Porsche Cayman. Now, would that be the GT4 road going model by any chance, would it? Yes, we've we've uh, as part of it. I mean, the 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 real core of what we do on the uh, Porsche Sport podcast is 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 personal interest interviews of the people of Porsche. Mm -hmm. The majority of that is drivers, naturally, but we 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 go into team owners, photographers, engineers, um, and and you know, and many many other people who relate to the to the Porsche world. Dude, one of our favorites actually was having a uh, Kelly Brule who has. Um, a company called Cabrew Communications, and she yep. looks after the PR for many of the IMSA uh, uh, sports car teams, and she's been hugely helpful to us. Uh, along with a guy called Tom Moore, who looks at who has a company called Dark Horse Autosport, and his company look after motorsport PR in America for for Porsche, and he's been in the sport a long time, and they've been brilliant at setting up interviews with. You know, sometimes people who have been interviewed a lot, like Hurley Haywood, which was a huge privilege to get to sit and chat to him. Uh -huh. Um, but then also some people that people might have never interviewed before. You know, look at somebody like uh, Seth Nyman, who owned Flying Lizard. He was the guy who really backed Flying Lizard, set up Flying Lizard, backed it, and 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 they uh, grew it to what it was, and created the legends around Flying Lizard. And he not not really done many public if any public interview certainly in recent times since he stopped racing so to have him on and hear their story and and you mentioned mark mark was our most recent episode what an interesting story he's had in both behind the wheel and behind the desk i suppose you could say it uh at, at work and and um 
uh, and in, in studying as well. But one segment that we're adding to the show, because Porsche has such a, a diverse world around it between the road cars, the racing, mm-hmm. the culture, etc. Um, and road cars, the Porsche's road cars link to racing very closely, maybe yep. closer than any other brand. And so we've started doing road tests for the cars, which is obviously a hugely en- enjoyable process, but we want to get it right. We want it to be valuable to our listeners. So we've tested three cars so far. We started actually, and it was a great place to start. We started with the base Cayenne, uh, right. the 2.9 liter V6 petrol Cayenne. And it was a complete eat your heart moment because I've been very vocal on the show about not being a fan of SUVs to put it mildly, I don't like the SUV category. I think they're too big, they're too heavy, they're too expensive, and they're badly packaged. Well, the Cayenne, the Cayenne made me eat my heart. It's an incredible performing car. It, I had it for a week, so it was great to really get under the surface of the car. And I, you know, for all all the, it, it just boggled my mind what it was able to do compared to other SUVs that are driven as well. When you take it into context of its competitors, it makes it even more impressive. But then I was down at Porsche Reading at their headquarters and tested two cars, tested the Cayenne, no, I'm going to try the Cayenne Turbo S Hybrid, which has got to be one of the silliest cars I've ever driven. And silly in the way that it just makes you giggle. It's enormous it weighs 2.6 tons and i've never been in a car that accelerates even remotely as fast as this thing does um it's got 700 horsepower it sounds like a nascar and you put your foot down and i honestly felt like it was going to do a wheelie it's that powerful and it the traction is just so good uh so that was an quite a eye eye opening experience but mm-hmm. in the afternoon as you said we tried the, the gt4 which it's the first time I'd ever driven a Porsche GT department car, which comes from the department, the race department. Uh-huh. And pff, what a special, special piece of kit. And the re- review for that will be coming soon with uh, in, in-car uh, reflections as well. So, And it carries so much from about 80% of that car goes into the GT4 race car. Um, so it's, it's, and it's only 100 kilograms heavier than the race car, which is really remarkable so the car itself is is amazing and if you can get an allocation for one it's a, just under the price of a base 911 so you can have the base 911 or you can have the all singing all dancing cayman i would go for the all singing all dancing cayman myself actually. yeah I, i'd probably do the same myself uh considering <laughs> on p- p- price point um but moving on now from talking about cars i mean i was in the automotive industry for for two decades myself so i've driven oh, quite wow. a lot of cars so Mm. Uh, never worked for Porsche, uh, but I have driven a 911 GT2. I've oh, got to, oh. But, 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 but what was that like? All I'm going to say is two words: Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> it blew my. It, I mean, like the thing was my, <laughs> but it was one of my friends. Like he was working a high end job. He was earning six figures, and he went, "Yeah, we'll go out for a spin. You can, yeah, it's all right. I, I, I can get any. You know, everyone's covered on my car." I was like. I don't think what your insurance cost is, let alone your rear tires on the back of the bloody thing. And he said, "No, just push it." And I was like thinking, "I am, I'm, I went, I'm, I, I said, I'll go to the speed limit, but I'll get there as bloody quick as possible." And this was when, when uh, this was on the advent of PDKs coming out, mm-hmm. and I went, "Right, I'm going to launch it." Like literally, standing start. We we're on a country road. I went, "I'm going to do a naught to 60. and. The minute I pressed that throttle down, rear tires started lighting up. Elevens is, and he went, "God, you you know how to put the power down in this thing." I said, <laughs> "I said you've been treating this thing like a pussy cat. All it needs is a bit a bit of ragging. I mean that that's a flat six boxer engine in the back of that thing with a turbo on it. You got to give it the beans. Come on." <laughs> and yeah, I literally, I've never seen a car go so quickly to sixty in all my life that I've actually yeah. been behind the wheel of so and that was a long long time ago that was probably 15 or so years ago but of course uh so this would be a 996 gt2 yeah i think so yeah, yeah. nice the original widow me actually i could tell you a story about that if, if, if you allow me uh yeah. when timo timo bernhard who has the outright outright lap record at the nurburgring five minutes 19 seconds in the 919 evo and for anyone who's ever watched that clip yeah 
if they were looking at it, if someone just showed it to them on a on a screen, they would go, "No, that's been sped up. That's, that's impossible. It can't be that fast." Um, and it, it is that fast. It's just that incredible thing to watch. But Timo, you know, he's won the Nurburgring twenty four hour as many times as anybody, five times. You know, mm-hmm. he's a lap record holder, etc. However, when he was a Porsche Junior in the early two thousands, he was get told by Hart McChristen, the boss of Porsche Motorsport at the time, to go and learn the Nürburgring. And he was the fastest road car that Porsche made at the time. It was just before the Carrera GT, which would have been even more scary. Uh, they gave him a they gave him a nine nine eleven GT two to go and said off you go go and do some laps. And he said, Timo Bernard did not even. He said to me, I, I didn't even make it halfway round. He said I pulled off halfway through the lap because I was so frightened. And he said, I phoned Hart McChristen. He said, oh, where did you crash? He said, no, I, I didn't crash. I didn't crash. No, come on. It's okay. Well, we can sort it. No, I haven't crashed. He said, I'm just terrified. And he said, good. Never forget this. This is always have that respect for the Nürburgring. And it was a 996 GT2 car that um, that, 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 that taught, taught him that. So even if, if it scares Timo Bernard, it can scare anybody. <laughs> That's a that's a big calling card right there for anyone that's uh, yeah, going to have the absolutely. widow maker effectively. Well, ca- car, car and circuit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now we talked about Colin McRae a little bit earlier on. Um, obviously, you know, Gordon Chad and John Cleland. Apart from, like, say, Colin, who was like the at the 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 gestation period of your love of motorsport. Are there any particular favourite drivers that you've that you've uh, you've talked to or commentated on? uh that that you've that you've met and you've gone you know what i i I want to follow them are there any particular drivers that you have as favorites apart from like say colin uh in terms of scots scotsman well in general yeah i mean it, well in in scotsman i think it's it's definitely i think role, role models are vitally important um mm-hmm. in anything and I, i've always admired the way that alan mcish went yes. and goes about his business in and out of the car is exactly the mold that you would tell any young driver to to follow. Um, in, I mean, an absolute absolute animal in the car, and if 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 he needed to put it right on the edge to get something done, he would do it. Mm-hmm. Um, whether that be when he drove for Porsche or particularly in his days with Audi, some of the stints that he did, um, just remarkable. But the, I think also that's equally impressive is the way that he carries himself out of the car how much of a pr dream mm-hmm. uh he was how he he really understood the duties out of the car and still does and look where he is now he's uh i, I couldn't tell you what his exact official title is but he's right at the forefront of audi motorsport i i don't know but he, i wouldn't be i would not be surprised if it was announced that he was a big part of the upcoming Audi F1 program because he's that highly thought of. Of course, did a very good job with Audi's Formula E team, their most successful era. It's no accident that Alan was in charge of the team at that point. Um, so uh, he's definitely one that that I look up to in terms of uh, people uh, non non Scotsmen. Uh, I mean, whew, uh, the, 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 where where do you begin? I mean, Hurley Hayward would be one, although he's he's yeah. he's long past retired. But I've I've read up a lot about him. His his book, his wonderful book, is is sitting on my shelf there. Um, what he did in his career through so many different styles of car: five wins at Daytona, three at Le Mans, and in different years. And you know, Hurley. There's a great movie about him that was directed by um, and produced by Patrick Dempsey. And the book and the film, Hurley took the decision to announced oh well not to announce but to acknowledge publicly his um sexuality as a as a gay yeah. man and I, and that was and what really stuck to me was how brave he had to be in the 1960s 1970s where that was nowhere near as accepted as it is today um and he mm. had to keep that a secret because if he'd let it out he would have lost sponsors you know there was tennis uh, female tennis players at the time who lost sponsorship deals when they announce their uh, their sexuality publicly so i think harley's an incredibly brave man uh in the car out of the car uh what he was capable of doing uh and the fact that he's still to this day a, a porsche uh 
for lack of a better word, employee, employees really doing it an injustice. But I think brand ambassador is what they call it. Yeah. Like he's, I actually, I interviewed him in the Porsche hospitality at, at Daytona and just a complete gentleman, um, an absolute badass in the race car uh, and a winner, you know, a, a winner in every sense of the world. So, the word. so I would say them and in a very much a more modern sense, uh-huh. you can't help but be in awe of what Kevin Esther does in a race car. Uh, oh my God, Yes. There's a, I mean, there's a Porsche theme here, but the, there's Kevin. What he does in a race car is just ab- incredible. But also, again, out of the car, he's such a humble person, such a down to earth person. Um, will will say will will not be afraid to say something on you know firm if he feels it necessary and if it feels it's the right thing to say at the right time. But he's a he's an incredible driver, very much a family man as well, and yeah, very very modest guy. He's um he's he's a he's a, a cool dude. Yeah, they they would be my they would be my three sort of present, near present and past. I think those would be my three. <laughs> okay, well we we haven't got we've got to wrap this up in about the next five and a half minutes anyway, because that's when this uh when this recording continue oh well uh, <laughs> concludes, but. Have you ever been starstruck with a racing driver you've met? Oh, good question. Um, do you know, Alex, this is something I really worried about when I got into um when I got into the doing motorsport commentary and interviewing professionally, I was really worried that I was gonna be I was really gonna struggle with with that because when I went to races as a fan, I couldn't even bring myself to get within 10 yards of a a driver or even up even as an adult i just whatever there was i was just like i just kind of froze but mm-hmm. it, i've actually found that easier because you know that there's a purpose for you being there yeah. um so i've actually found that found that um okay uh as long as they know they know that you're meant to be there and you, you're you know that as long as there's an understanding there and you're there in a professional capacity then it hasn't been a problem um I mean, uh, interviewing Jackie X was a bit of a, whew, that that was a, uh, a, a kind of, uh, yeah, that was a that was an adrenaline rush as well. Um, and quite a difficult guy to interview actually, um, because he's got so many stories, he's got so much to tell, and he's such a reflective guy that often he doesn't end up answering your question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you've kind of got you go, ah, oh, what am I going to do now? And he, he he throws you off completely. So he's actually a. Uh, he he's wonderful, and I mean the fact that he gave the time um, oh. to for an interview, I appreciate that immensely. But he was he was a challenge. He was a real challenge uh, to to interview. Yeah, I I kind of had the same thing back in, I think it was two thousand two thousand and fifteen or two thousand and sixteen. I interviewed Alex Zanardi. And, oh wow! Um, let's just say that the aura that that man has is nothing short of incredible. And I did this like. Yeah. Ma- uh, uh, and I mentioned about his F3000 days uh, it, when he raced with Il, Il Baroni Rampanti, which is a team that still exists to this day. And the intro must have been about 30 seconds because I wanted to nail it perfectly. And he's gone, thank you very much for the introduction. And I was just like, oh, I, I, and it was, it, that was the, that's the only time I've actually truly been starstruck. Um, yeah. but to me, Alex, what a nice guy. And mm. we, we caught up a couple of times in, in the BMW hospitality. We were actually recording the interview during DTM free practice one for the Hockenheim season finale that year. Um, well, we've got, um, I, I, let's, let's rattle through these. So, uh, commentary idols, Peter, who's on your list? Oh, good question. Uh, Bex Williams. Uh, the voice of World Rallying. She's a superstar. I'm uh, very lucky to call her a, a colleague and a, and a friend. Hopefully, she thinks me a friend. <laughs> uh, no, we, we work on we've worked on several rallies and and we'll do again this year. She's a, a superstar. Knows her sport inside out. The drivers love her. Everyone in the sports loves her. But when you listen to her commentate, so um so polished, so enthusiastic, so good to listen to, whether it be an audio or on radio. Yeah, I, I really look up to Bex a lot. Um, I look up to to Shay Adam um, as well. Yes. Um, the level of prep that she puts in for her, her work as a pit lane reporter, and she does comment, quite a lot of commentary now as well with Mazdas and uh, Michelin Pilot Challenge and, and other things. Um, yeah, 
really, really good. Um, really, really good uh, professional. Uh, I, I, I would say. I think those are those are the two people that I kind of uh, look up to. Uh, and I, and I, I, what I can't go without mentioning Nick Harris, uh, who was the voice of MotoGP for many years. It's a personally, I think it's a travesty that he isn't still the voice of MotoGP and. That's my ultimate goal of where I would like to get to is to be the English voice in MotoGP and to be like Nick Harris. He would, yeah, he would be be up there too. Peter, we we've got a couple more questions to to sort of really go through before we we close off episode sixteen. Um, now this is one I always like that that there's some really really good questions that will make ev they they make every single one of my guests think and that's the whole purpose because i want people to get to know the people behind the microphones and i hope everyone's been enjoying episode 16 because it's been because we're going to get onto that that rs spider later <laughs> on after we've done the final question we've got to do that just for just for the hell of it um now if you can i know this is going to be like picking hen's teeth but what are your favorite what's your top 3 moments in commentary now this is nondescript in the fact that it can be from either moments that you've commentated on or from somebody else that you've actually heard commentate on other racing oh uh very good question um i would th i think in no particular order uh i would say the first really big race that i got to work on was the 2021 Nürburgring 24 hour um which was won by Manta it was actually fog delayed through the night um yes uh but what it meant was that the intensity of the restarted race was incredible I think it was about oh my memory serves me about four hours sprint to the flag and it was so intense uh even more than an N24 usually is mm -hmm. and Manta racing won and it was Kev Kevin Estra, Michael Christensen, um, Matteo Cairoli. And Lars Kern was on the entry list, but sadly never drove. So he didn't get classified as a winner, um, which is a pity. But again, that was more to do with the, you know, that was more to do with the, the shortening of the race, which I think affected the, the stint plan. Uh -huh. But the, I remember uh, being in, in the booth along. So I was actually commentating it from home because at this point, this was long before we all got back to the track. It was done all done remotely, but doing it from home and it was in the kind of virtual booth, if you like, alongside uh, John Hindoff. And uh, I think it was just the two of us in the, in the booth at that stage. So, and uh, yeah, the last couple of laps and, uh, you know, um, Kevin Esther took the car to the flag and there was some great shots of his, his lovely wife, Caro, Hold, uh, holding their their son Tommy, who was fast asleep, he was oblivious to all the excitement <laughs> going on. And Kevin won, and he'd been trying for many years to to win the Nurburgring Twenty Four Hour. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of one of the big races, missing off his off his impressive CV. Um, and yeah, so so that was. But I think it was it was quite an emotional moment for me because it was uh, it was a sort of realization of of a, a dream to be able to kind of be in that position. At, uh, and to 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 be in charge of, or alongside John, of, you know, calling that moment, mm -hmm. and then so that would be that would be one. Uh, again, I'd come back to, um, Nick again. Yeah, Nick Nick, Nick Harris. Uh, you could pick so many different I, most iconic moments in MotoGP. He commented on, uh, you know, the Sepang twenty fifteen. Uh, Valentino Rossi and Mark Marquez is uh, incident oh, to, to, yes. to put it mildly, um, and also you know two thousand and six when Nicky Hayden won the world championship, the late great Nicky Hayden, and again mm -hmm. Nick was was kind of part of that. So that would definitely be those would be two, and then got to have a not kill one in there somewhere. I think uh, four. Um, do you know, actually, it's 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 more of a kind of generic answer, but we had uh, uh, we have a fantastic motorcycle racing paddock in Scotland um, that run under the clubs called K KMSC, which is Knockhill Motorsports Club. So there's the KMSC runs just at Knockhill, but you have the Scottish Championship, which runs at Knockhill, and a, a temporary circuit called East Fortune down in East Lothian, and the 
in in my first full year of commentating at Knock Kill, we had an amazing battle for the Superbike Scottish Championship between a guy called Callum Grieger on a Kawasaki uh, and a guy called Greg Kilfillan on a Suzuki, and two more different characters you couldn't find. Your Callum's very much outgoing, uh, big character of the paddock, um, and his riding style is the same. It's very outlandish. It's big movement. He muscles the bike around, whereas Greg's a lot more smoother, quieter, gentler, but lap time identical. Couldn't Can't tell them apart. And Greg's a, he's a lot more quiet in terms of his demeanour. But watching yeah. these two complete polar opposite athletes competing with one another, yes, it's not MotoGP, it's not even World, it's not World Superbikes, it's not British Superbikes, but I can assure you these guys were given it 150%. Uh, there was nothing left of them after those 10 lap sprint races. And that was like the the most kind of high energy comment, uh, high energy commentary I've I've experienced personally. Uh, and trying to control that energy and trying to get the and get the output right is you know not get too over excited and blow blow the microphone out the window, but also make sure you're giving the. Uh, what is predominantly a radio audience uh, uh, a, a feel of what's going on. So they would be my three, I think. Okay. Final question, Peter. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is where things get interesting because not do just not does just my guest answer this question. I also make a uh, answer to it as well. Okay, good. So if you ha- if you had an unlimited budget, so effectively no glass ceiling, and you had mm-hmm. to pick any race or road car of your choice and mm-hmm. circuit that you would drive it on, mm-hmm. what would you choose? Ooh. Okay. Okay. I think... Mm-hmm. Can I get? Can I have a coach? You can if you I'm want. I'm allowed a coach. I'm gonna have Alan McNish as my coach. Yeah, because I feel he would say it as it is. If I was rubbish, he would say so. Um, and I, th- I would like Alan to be there as my coach. I would love to. It's a car that never ever raced, but it's highly important to the to the RS Spider. Uh, it's a car called the. It's known as the LMP two thousand. Uh, it was a Porsche prototype race car, open top prototype with a V10 engine that what derived actually from a cancelled project for Formula One for McLaren. So Porsche had this rocket ship engine. I mean, it really was an engine that was going to change. Uh, it was going to dominate in Formula One in the back of a McLaren. And it, it got yeah. cancelled because Porsche as a company were trying to cut down their motorsport spending. But the engine was then... Add it, of course, an F1 engine can't isn't suitable for 24 hours, so they bored it out, lowered the revs, and it went in the back of this LMP 2000, which sits in the Porsche private collection. Okay, and... Bob Wallach mm-hmm. and Alan McNish. And that car, and... yeah, I was going to say because I've just been looking that up, and that also had a different name as well, the 9R3. Yeah, so 9R3 is its in, internal code name. So the RS Spider is called 9R6, which is the next one along. And my, I believe the 919 is called the 9R9. Uh, so that's its internal Porsche code name. So it was going to be, apparently it was going to be called the LMP2000. So they it was tested for 78 kilometers at Visac. Bob, Bob Wallach sadly passed away not long after that. Um, so Alan McNish is the only guy alive to to drive it. And I spoke to him at length about what it, what it was like to drive. And... Um, you know, he the, the car was the project was cancelled. In fact, it had already been cancelled before they did the shakedown, but they'd been promised for the morale of the team and etc. to at least see it run after all that effort had gone into it. Yeah. And from what Alan tells me, he said it would have been a very special car. Whether it would have beaten the RDR8, hard to know, but he said it would have at least, it definitely would have competed. So, but the, a lot of the underpinnings of that car went into the Carrera GT uh, road car and the V10 engine was used as a base for the Carrera GT engine as well. So whoever, all the people I've spoke to who have either driven or owned a Carrera GT, they all say it's just the, the ultimate. And a big part of that is because of the, the LMP2000. So the LMP2000, but I need to give you a circuit, don't I? Um, yes. Oh, ah, I think, well, I think it would have been 
pretty reasonable to expect it would go on to America, and I think America has the best racetracks in the world. Uh, I think somewhere where Alan was a master at as well, Road Atlanta. So it would be the oh. LMP2000 Road Atlanta with Alan there as a coach. But then I would do some laps and then say, right, Alan, come on, you come on, you show us, show us, show us, show us what it's supposed to do. <laughs> so that would that would be my choices. Yeah. Oh, the 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 very circuit that also hosts Petit Le Mans every year, ten mm-hmm. hour race. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think also now has Michelin in front of its name now, if I remember correctly. Yes, it does. Michelin t- Raceway Road Atlanta. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a bit. It's, so it's, what would it, yours be then? You've well, got to think of this every time, Matt. This. <laughs> oh no! Don't worry, because as soon as I know, I always look for a genre at that particular. I'm I'm going to look within the the Volkswagen Automotive Group family for this one. Okay, good. That's a good broad topic. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. So right, you say Road Atlanta. I'm going to do the circuit first. So we're going to oh, go the other way around. Okay. So you say Road Atlanta. I'm going to say Laguna Seca. Great choice as well. That was, yeah, that was Weather, it yeah. was in there in my head. Yeah, great yeah. choice. Yeah. Full nomenclature, folks. WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca used to be Mazda yeah. Raceway Laguna Seca at one point, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we're going to go with a car that also was, uh, well, was developed, and this was when a certain brand with the four rings announced in 1998 they were going to enter Le Mans. Ah. Uh-huh. And it's the R8C 3.6 litre V8 twin turbo Audi R8C would be my choice. Is that the one with the roof? That is the one with the roof because the R8. That's an excellent choice. The R, yeah. I mean, for those wondering, um, it was actually under the LMGTP. Uh, That's what the Mm -hmm. category was at that time, folks. And so what they did was that the ACO modified the classification for the rules in 99. So in GT ranks, the GT1 was replaced by GTS. And then uh-huh. the ACO then com- then created the LMGTP category, which now has evolved to the hypercars that we now see with the likes of the Peugeot 9X8, which I still cannot get over how they're able to bring so much downforce through the underflooring with no rear wing to speak of. So hats off to, 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 to Peugeot and the team there. And it was also, for those wondering, it was also designed by Peter Ellery to compete at the 1999 24 Hours of Le Mans under the LM GTP category. And it was actually developed alongside the the open top R8R LMP category Spider prior to being replaced by the R8 in 2000. And that would be my choice, the R8C. Great choice. Who's your driver coach? Who would you who would you have for Laguna? Tom, uh, well, we're going to go Audi on this one. None other than nine-time Le Mans winner Tom Christensen. Tom TK, that's oh. a that's a heck of an American track day trip, isn't it? It's uh, Laguna Seca and the L- uh, Laguna Seca and the R8, R8C and uh, Road Atlanta and the LMP2000 uh, Porsche. Yeah, I mean, pretty good. Well, Exactly. And folks, that's it for episode 16 of Commentator's Corner. Peter, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, buddy. Thank you.